Good afternoon, everybody. Indeed, I want to thank Zakia Kafafi and Ivor Samuel for inviting me to give this plenary lecture at this SPIE meeting. We are living in very extraordinary times. I would have loved to come to San Diego and spend time with my long year friends and colleagues. However, we have to escape to this virtual space and I thank SPIE engineers indeed to, make this, to have made this possible that we can make today this meeting. And indeed, this is a great achievement that many, many people can see this lecture now and also in recorded form later. Today, I want to talk about from organic electronics to bioorganic electronic materials or systems. And indeed, I want to take you to a journey with me that which marks actually our own development in the last couple of years. And indeed, we are going more and more in the bio direction at our institute. And this indeed is very exciting. And I want to share this excitement today with you in one or two examples, which I have chosen. Let me start first with Forrest Carter. I mean, this gentleman dubbed the name of molecular electronics in 1970s. And he passed uh, early young age. And, and indeed, this statement that the electronics of the 21st century will be based on molecular chemistry and physics has been indeed coming out in this last couple of years. We know there are many, many OLED screens. Also, even the LCD is an organic molecule, of course, and tin film and flexible displays is a technology right now. And you can also use them as lighting. And this is, for example, from Yonezawa, Lumiotech. These are these panels which can be used as lighting, they can change the color upon changing the voltage. And indeed, if you look to this ultra thin stretchable devices, which we published with Matthew White when he was in Linz, he's himself now a professor in the US in Vermont. And indeed, these are stretchable, pretty rugged systems. They are working under different stress, mechanical stress. And if we go further, that you can print these molecules, these technologies in large scale and large area with roll to roll production. Of course, this is an important uh, development for electronics industry, which combines the semiconductor properties of a material together with the processibility of dyes and inks and polymers. And this young gentleman here is me uh, 25 years ago. And uh, actually this uh, other gentleman, many of you know, he was actually my first co-worker when I came to Linz. His name is Christoph Prabetz. He himself is a professor, big professor in, in Germany right now. And these inks I have been mentioning indeed can be prepared for different colors, for different materials. And this is actually the biggest advantage for me, for my taste. I'm educated as a physicist and as a semiconductor physicist. And even though I'm now professor for physical chemistry and moving more and more to biological materials, bio integrations, et cetera, Still, a semiconductor physicist in me is fascinated by these organic semiconductors because you can change the band gap. You can change the properties of these semiconductors by chemical synthesis, by slight modifications of the side chains. Whole polymer chain can have a very different band gap. This is something which is very difficult to achieve in uh, inorganic semiconductors. For organic solar cells, where my contribution was majorly in there, it's normally so that we have a donor acceptor bilayer or mixed system, 
and the donor chromophore, if it's excited, creates this exciton. Exciton moves to an interface, to an acceptor, and at this interface, it is then separated into charges. And this charge separation is the most important issue to make an efficient solar, organic solar cell. And indeed, there are two systems, bilayer systems have been already invented and first shown by Ching Tang in Kodak in nine, late 1970s and Balketro Junction we reported in 1992. Since then, the field has evolved and matured and you have seen many, many different lectures and books and, and big papers. I don't want to go into detail in this point. Let me just give some remark that I was asked many times, what's the optimum geometry for organic solar cells? And this is a donor acceptor, basically interpenetrating network of two phases. And these phases, however, should have a separation from each other on the order of exciton diffusion length on those materials. And exciton diffusion length in organic uh, chromophores are in solid state on the order of 10, 20 nanometers. And this is, of course, pretty small. To have such an engineering that we can have these interpenetrating networks with lithography would be possible, but would be very difficult and, and probably uh, industrial, uh, not so feasible. But there are other methods, for example, donor acceptor self-organization. These are indeed what we call deep block copolymers. They can self-organize in lamella forms, in columnar forms, in discotic forms. And it's interesting that we are now entering the range of this supramolecular ordering in polymers. And this is also a great advantage in our system. Of course, what we see here are very preliminary results and today, this field has matured all the way to several groups reported now above 15% power conversion efficiencies. But we have also shown that you can make these things pretty thin, as in the light emitting diode case. This work was with Martin Kaltenbrunner, Matthew White. And indeed, this is possible that you can make these kinds of solar cells pretty thin. And that makes, of course, possible that this things can be applied onto surfaces. And like this industry 4.0 electronics everywhere, et cetera, you need maybe some kind of cloth integration, textile integration. And these kind of very thin coatings as organic solar cells is indeed quite promising. And what I want to mention also is that the weight of such a solar cell is of course very, very, very low. And therefore, this uh, specific uh, produced watts per gram is indeed orders of magnitude better than silicon or inorganic based devices. And therefore, it could be interesting for aerospace applications where the weight is an important issue and, uh, and efficiency per weight is, is quite important there. Last but not least, I want to mention here, there was a nice project with my esteemed colleague, Arvid Hübler from Chemnitz. We said, can we print these things in a conventional printing machine? As you know, Germany has indeed a very long history in printing technology, and you can indeed make such, for example, in that case, P3 HD PCBM solar cells, indeed roll to roll produce, in a conventional printing machine and this on paper. And the paper is, of course, is a very interesting material. It's biodegradable, biocompatible. We will come to this point in a minute. So if students watching this webinar are interested with Alan Heger, my old master, when I was in Santa Barbara, of course, we together with Namdas, we indeed published this semiconducting metallic polymers in Oxford graduate texts. And this is a textbook for students and for ongoing specialists, and I recommend that book too. Now coming to this development, going from organic electronics away into bioorganic bio systems, our starting point was actually twofold. One was this electronic waste. 
and indeed it is a great problem. Also the biocompatible and biodegradable electronic materials can do the second job that we can make in vivo electronics and biomedical implants or biomedical uh, devices. And this is the second uh, issue which came on to us. And I want to go and make these two cases today with you here. We are indeed moving from consumer electronics to consumable electronics. And this statement of Akira Morita, this is long years chairman of Sony Incorporation, is indeed getting through these days. There are billions of cell phones are used and also thrown away. And this is an electronic waste which has, to my opinion, great problems and it will create great problems in future for getting the raw materials if we don't recycle these things. Also the plastic, and we are talking about nice plastic devices, organic solar cells, plastic solar cells, etc., cetera, and, and large scale. Even today we have a problem with our plastic waste. And as you know, of course, from normal news, and I'm showing this slide for more than 10, 15 years, this is a shame. I mean, what we have done in our oceans with these materials, it's a shame. We should really use materials which are biodegradable. Polyolefins are not. And we have to move away from these materials. Doing the same job, but biocompatible, biodegradable materials, which will then vanish perfectly benignly over the year in, in, in some kind of natural environment. This is not a quite good thing. And this is our responsibility as scientists. We can blame many things to the politicians, but I believe this plastic, which is not biodegradable, was our scientific mistake to do in the beginning, to change to biodegradable materials. And I want to tell, of course, in great detail about this in a different lecture, but what we had, the search started around 2005, is to have organic and bio-organic, bio-origin, biodegradable semiconductors, conductors, and substrates and devices. And we found some, I mean, for example, many of you might know, some of you might not know that beta carotene is a very good P-type semiconductor, organic semiconductor. And I want to cite here this uh, work of Mihai Iremia Vladu. Dr. Vladu is back again in Linz now with us. And uh, this, for example, uh, transistor, this is an organic field effect transistor based on beta carotene indeed shows quite some uh, switching and these materials work and we can use for example glucose and caffeine as gate insulator and this went that far that Michael Irimia Vladu indeed made these nice transistors and after measuring them he was eating them so we had this cover page in journals and we had also some news uh, papers uh, in our institute, they wanted just to see that somebody eats a transistor. And at one point, uh, indeed, if we go searching, we ended up with this biblical material. This is called indigo. Indigo, many of you, of course, know as the blue jean color. This blue color and, and then in fabric is indeed indigo dyes. Indigo comes originally from indigo ferra, and this is one of the most produced uh, dye stuff in the world. And this actually is the formula of indigo. As you look at the molecules, it's a mole molecule. And if we did not have these hydrogen bondings, then it will be probably even not conjugated, but due to this hydrogen bonding, the intramolecular hydrogen bonding, the system becomes quite stable and also semiconducting. And this was the origin of chemical industry. In Germany, there are many, many companies, they are named actually after aniline. And aniline is exactly the heating product of indigo 
and Portuguese anil is also indigo. And indeed, BASF and Gulf Aqua, all these uh, companies have the name aniline in their, in their title. And this was the beginning actually of uh, chemical industry. And if we go further, apparently indigo is known even in the biblical times, but all these 4,000, 5,000 years, nobody ever made a diode or transistor with this indigo material. So we did it and indeed it shows uh, as a beautiful semiconducting material. And it's an ambipolar material, so it can uh, indeed be switched and off it can be switched on the fly from n-type to p-type operation. This is also something interesting for a semiconductor physicist. Normally silicon semiconductors are doped either p-type or n-type and n-type uh, field effect transistor you cannot switch to p-types <laughs> on the fly. So what these materials organic semiconductors you can. And this was the Eric Krovatsky's PhD thesis. Eric is now himself a a uh, big professor now in Sweden, in Linköping, Norköping. But the most important thing I want to mention here is this uh, stability. Here is trian purple shown. Trian purple is just a deep bromo indigo. And if you do a diode, for example, and processed in air, kept in air, measured in air, it is stable. And this is something not so trivial for organic semiconductors because organic semiconductors are always have been <laughs> accused that they are unstable for many applications but these materials seem to be stable and look at this basically uh, gravimetric analysis here and you can have for example this epindolidium and i will show you in a minute the formula this is a uh, pentacene analog uh, Quinacrin is a pentacene analog, tetracene and epindolinium are analogs to each other. And this is stable above 500 Celsius. And this is quite remarkable for an organic material. And if you go further, uh, why it is so stable? I have a working hypothesis, but of course it's very difficult to bring it into the proof phase. Normal organic semiconductors are van der Waals molecular solids. That means the molecules are kept in crystal structure through Van der Waals forces. And we know that Van der Waals forces are weak forces. Inorganic semiconductors on the other hand are of course covalently bound and therefore much much more stable. There is also ionic semiconductors now which we call perovskite family. This is also highly interesting but the hydrogen bonded semiconductors it could be that they are, in addition to Van der Waals forces, more stability in many ways. So if you go and look to the nature, and indeed these hydrogen bonds are the basics of biology. All these specific molecules, DNAs, RNAs, are all based on hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is, we looked and found one material which is actually synthetic material, which probably also gets its strength from this hydrogen bonding. This is Kevlar, it's a pyramid fiber. This is indeed used for bulletproof vests, etc. And it's highly interesting that this material is indeed quite stable, and this might be also due to this hydrogen bonding. So this is the conacridone. This is a hydrogen bonding analogon of pentacene five-member ring, but NH and double C double O. These are peptide bonds, as we know. And if you put these materials actually and into operation, air-stable operation in offets are possible. Look here, tetracene and pantacene are dying. Now, these transistors are more or less giving up the operation uh, after some days. And the epi and the conacridone are indeed very, very good, stable. Now, yeah, there's always a backside of the story. Indigo is very stable, indigo family is very stable, but it's very difficult to process them, very difficult to solubilize them because of this hydrogen bond stabilizes the system. So if you block this hydrogen bond, and this trick actually we learned from Gundula Foss, she is from uh, Bayreuth in Germany, and she was teaching us this chemistry that you put a substituent on the nitrogen 
And this substituent on nitrogen is actually giving you uh, solubility. And then if you heat this material, this is called T-Bock group, and if you heat this material, it falls back to the unsubstituted form. So this gives you a latent, basically, pigment, which is soluble, latent solubility. And we will see this, this will be very important in many other ways. For example, if you make it latent soluble, you can make substitutions, you can make chemistry on it. So like here, we added, for example, thiophanes on that. Or you can make polymers. You can really process these things into t form and then make the whole chemistry and in the end convert it back. So this is transiently soluble in the gross form processing. And last but not least, you can make beautiful pigment nanocrystals out of these materials using that trick. As many of you know, this nanocrystal synthesis by hot injection method can be used now here. And if you inject this t bulk latent pigment into a hot bath, it will basically lose this t bulk group and fall back. And you can stabilize these kind of system. This was the PhD thesis of Michael Sitnik. He is now also in Germany. And now you can do a whole gymnastic and Michael did this gymnastic and you can make many, many different phases, nanoparticles on that. So that far that good, I want to draw your attention to this famous hedgehog type nanocrystals. I will come to this uh, in a minute. These are very interesting. So now there is also a little bit interesting work we have done in collaboration with Yong Chin and Wei Zhang with Alexander Kovalenko. You can use also indeed some bacteria, some system to synthesize indigodine, for example, uh, for us. And this is also biosynthesis of materials. And one example I want to show also that adamantane actually is a side group which stabilizes these materials even further. And these materials, which are hydrogen bonded materials, can be substituted and can be more stabilized in the side chain. So now these are the so-called hydrogen bonded semiconductors, which we introduce now into the biomedical devices and in general is uh, processing of these materials for biomedical applications. And here is an example with artificial retina. The first thing we need is a material a device which operates underwater. And if you take normally a normal semiconductor or normal organic semiconductor, put it underwater, it's actually not so stable because photochemically it will degrade if you shine light on it or make electrical currents through it. But this was a high opener for us. For example, here, indeed, we have done this organic semiconductor, especially these epindolidiums, are very good stable underwater under different pH. This was the halime joshkin thesis. And this is the first criteria. We need, of course, semiconductors and devices which are stable underwater, even without encapsulation. Second, of course, is that our living cells and bacteria and, and biosystems are growing on this organic semiconductors, is this a, some kind of a possibility that we can indeed use these materials as substrates to sell grown on that? And now comes this famous hedgehog nanoparticles. Indeed, this was the Maria Keshova thesis. These hedgehogs are quite interesting because living cells are attracted and bound to these hedgehog structures with great strength. It's unusual that the same material actually in a plain thin film has a different bio uh, settled, settling biosystems on it than these hedgehogs. Apparently the cells love these kinds of hedgehog structures and they grow on that quite nicely. And if you go and make patch clamp measurements, and look to the cell response upon photo exciting the organic semiconductor underneath. That is, for example, very nice that you can observe that you can open the channels. You can open the ion channels 
by using lasers exciting the semiconductor underneath. So this is semiconductor layer. You put basically this uh, cells on top of it. The cells don't absorb these lasers, but the semiconductor or bioorganic semiconductor absorbs it. And if you excite them, the material, which is bio cell, living cell opens its channels. This is a work in collaboration with Professor Schindel. He moved also now to Medical University Graz. And then calcium channels you can open and close with light. So this is something quite interesting. And uh, I will just skip this hex cells we use normally, but there are two options of this switching functions. The first option is that there is a capacitive voltage we create and this capacitive voltage is opening and closing the channels. Or this is a photothermal effect. We simply heat it up locally and this can also create channel opening. Of course, photothermal effects are undesired effects. Capacitive coupling is much better. This is much more safe. But if you have a possibility to open and close the ion channels, of course, we can immediately think of retinal bipolar cells in human eye, because these cells are also opening and closing ion channels upon light stimulation, photostimulation. And if we could do this with our artificial systems, then this would be an artificial retina. Can we do that? Yes, in principle, it is, or it should be possible to have these microcrystals, nanocrystals, indeed put uh, behind the retina and then the cells, the uh, ganglions, and of course the cells grow, the bipolar cells grow on these artificial absorbers, and then the ion channels can be even colored uh, vision possible. And this is, of course, first suggested and worked out by Peter Fromherz using inorganic silicon chips. And he was working many years on this stimulation of neurons. Uh, and uh, he's retired now. But it's indeed very important uh, work of uh, Fromherz we will cite many times. Are there silicon-based artificial retina prothesis? Yes, they are. But the problem, of course, the silicon device have to be protected from water. And this is indeed the subretinal photodiode arrays are not so comfortable for the patient or also for the operation. And you need also some kind of battery and processors, etc. Can we do it without the battery? Can we do it without this rigidity of silicon devices? Yes, we can. And this was a beautiful collaboration with David Trant in the group of Yael Hanain, Prof. Yael Hanain in the Tel Aviv University. And at that time when Eric was with us, it was beautiful collaboration of work that indeed we showed that direct electrical neurostimulation with organic pigments upon light irradiation. These are basically photocapacitors which we use organic semiconductor bilayers. Many of you know this structure, of course, as this bilayer solar cell. This was a tongue type solar cell. And of course, there are also the groups in Milano and Anzani and, and his co-workers and many other groups are now working also with P3HD and more <laughs> uh, stimulations, etc. So this organic solar cells implanted in, 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 uh, in this case in the chicken embryo retina in the hands of David Trump and Yael Hanayn at Tel Aviv University. And you can see, indeed, there is a stimulation possible. So these results are highly encouraging. But again, we cannot go uh, to the human tests uh, before having all the other tests done. So now summarizing in this point is this bioorganic chips actually can be more biocompatible as compared to silicon-based devices. And this picture also from uh, David Brown and Peter uh, Fromherz indeed shows that the neurons grow on the transistors, but apparently this is difficult material, this inorganic semiconductors. Maybe organic semiconductors are more biocompatible.
And the second part is the stimulation. I mean, if you can stimulate the nerves and stimulate indeed, uh, <laughs> like this McCoy's uh, three quarters, and you can indeed maybe create some kind of therapeutic effect. And this is called in these days as electroceuticals as compared to pharmaceuticals with electrostimulation, for example, of vagus nerve, etc. Many people claim that you can indeed have quite some therapeutic effects. This can be a very interesting future in the next decades using photo or electrostimulated uh, stimulation of uh, nerves and biosystems to get a therapeutic effect. This is the interface maybe which we were looking for for a long time. As I always say, the human society have created life sciences, biomedical sciences in a quite high level. And the information technology, of course, is an amazing development in the last 40, 50 years. But these two big technologies, they do not communicate with each other as I think they could. And maybe, maybe organic electronic devices, bio-organic electronic devices can establish this future cybernetics. And this could be an interesting mission for organic materials, bio-organic semiconductors. Let me just close by showing you a very different story, which we are also described as biosystems. You can also design bio nano catalysts based on organic semiconductors, or organic materials. Of course, in that case, graphene, if it's an organic or not, is a difficult story, but uh, we have many conducting polymers, which we also uh, functionalized with bio catalysts or real uh, catalytical functional groups but this work just published this year. I want to mention this was the PhD work of Atai, and she went now back to Bangkok. It's a very co nice collaborational work with Aristides Pakandritos and, of course, Michael Opetka, Radek Boyle, Ogil in, in, in uh, Olomuts in Czech Republic. There, basically, we used uh, graphene as a platform on the graphene are uh, we immobilized enzymes. And there are three different enzymes, for example, in this work, collaborating with each other. And the CO2 is directly converted to uh, first formic acid and formaldehyde and to methanol in this nano biocatalyst. This is a wonderful piece of work, interdisciplinary work, I want to just to mention. This is also an application, of course, for bio systems bio-organic semiconductor systems, etc. With this, I want to close that our institute, of course, is working on organic and hybrid solar cells, CO2 recycling. However, the bio-organic electronic devices are getting more and more in action. And I want to draw your attention with this plenary to this field also. And this is just a cross section of our members of our institute. Many of them, of course, finished and went to other institutions, became professor themselves, etc. I mentioned several of them during this meeting. And uh, I thank, of course, to our collaborators. And I want to mention Siegfried Bauer, who actually passed away. And, and it's indeed very difficult to, very painful that he passed away so early. And, exactly in the year, actually, he was selected as SPIE fellow. He passed away and I'm, I'm indeed having still, still big grievance on that. So I would say thank you all for uh, collaboration. And thank you, of course, I'm thanking to our funding agencies and I want to draw your attention that we have a bioelectronics winter school, bioel.at. Please come and visit this uh, conference homepage. It's a beautiful site, and I hope when this 
epidem pandemic uh, is over, then we will be able to make a new start on that. Thank you very much.